The Red Prince and the Ghost Hunter Chapter Zero, A Shot in the Dark At the very end of Cinnamon Street was a house that has been abandoned for years. The paint was peeling, there was mold in the wood, the trees were bare of leaf even in the depths of summer, the grass was dead, and the lawn was nothing more than dirt that was somehow even deader than normal dirt. The shutters banged with or without wind, and there were always clouds over the building. Even during sunny weather, the last house on Cinnamon Street was always stormy. Every night and every day, spectral images could be seen throughout the house. Blue beams, flickering figures, and whimpering wisps wandered through the property. Sometimes they would wave at the people passing by. Other times they would frighten their neighbors away. These ghastly ghosts were all that remained of the most powerful family in River City. The Riley family. However, ever since they were all murdered nearly a hundred years ago, their house has been haunted. In River City, any house that was haunted could not be torn down, condemned, sold, nor taxed while the property was possessed. So people tried to exorcise them, scare them, or even just ask them to leave, but the ghosts refused to go. They wanted justice, and even after a hundred years, they still had no justice. So while the city refused to investigate the Riley's murder, the Riley's refused to move on, creating an impasse of sorts. On one fateful night, however, someone approached the house, somebody who nobody recognized. The figure took steps across the cracked walkway leading up to the porch and then walked up the creaking steps. This figure pushed open the heavy creaking door picking up lots of dust and even specks of ectoplasm as they walked in and they saw the first ghost of the house. She was floating a few feet above the floor. The phantasmal figure was the flickering form of the face of the family, Melody Riley, an older woman with see-through skin that showed her skeleton underneath. Her teeth, even decades after her death, were still dyed red in the fashion of her day. Her eyes were sunken and shriveled, showing only her sockets. Her hair still spilled past her shrunken shoulders and starved stomach. Her finger's flesh was flayed, leaving her phalanges more like torn talons than delicate digits. Her dress was a cotton down gown that fell past her floating feet into the filthy floor. The fluorescent faded flowers on her formal wear were in pastel purples, bright blues, and pretty pinks, and were all guarded by green grass. In life, such a dress would have been a marvel. But in death, it only added to her air of aggression. Melody silently turned towards the trespasser. The skeleton beneath her see-through skin shined like it was silver in the moonlight. Her dark eyes darkened even further as shadows spread across her face. First appearing as wrinkles, then as cracks, her skin began to shatter like porcelain and fall to the floor, revealing, to the, tr revealing the true horror underneath. Melody's skull faced the intruder, her bare, bloody teeth mere inches from the top of the intruder's hat. The now screaming banshee began to shriek so loudly that the neighbor's windows were shaking from the scream. And still, this was nowhere near as loud as she could be. She was giving the intruder a warning shout. The intruder only stared at her with steel behind their gray eyes, not even shaking from their si her seismic shriek. This is my house. Leave now and never return, or else I will tear the flesh from your bones and feed it to my famished family, Melody warned the trespasser. Normally, this was enough to sh scare off any would-be ghost hunter. Instead, the intruder only focused further on the lady of the house. The intruder's skull was protected by a black cowboy hat, their face protected by a gray bandana, and their eyes surrounded by shiny blue makeup, all serving to protect their identity. If Melody looked closely, she might have seen the bright yellow earplugs peeking out just beneath the intruder's bandanas, a chance she sadly squandered not knowing what she missed. The intruder, without saying a single word, lifted a heavy metal object from the right side. It glinted in the moonlight as a loud click could be heard right before a much louder bang boomed through the night. Any neighbors who were lucky enough to sleep through the Banshee's screens were certainly shaken awake by the shout of a silver bullet. The Banshee's head jerked back as the ghost began to both dissolve and evaporate. 
Melody's body became less and less defined as her skeleton splintered and her skin steamed. The cracks of her skin now dug deeper, directly into her brittle bones. Her skin steamed while it slogged off her breaking bones. When what was left of her bones were ground to dust, the dust then scattered, leaving only her dress behind. A tiny clink was heard when the ectoplasmic entity sublimated to steam. A silver bullet with the name Melody carved into it. The name had a bit of a glow to it, visible in the low light of the house. The name didn't glow before. The ghost killer picked up the shed bullet, careful not to leave footprints, fingerprints in the dust as they continued their hunt for the other ghosts. The room that Melody was in felt a bit warmer and even a little cleaner, but also emptier, like when a home had everything removed from it, including the memory of its old inhabitant. Beyond the living room was a kitchen. The cobwebs brushed past the inquisitive intruder as they stepped over holes in the floor, and were careful not to leave footprints in the dripping blue fluid from above. The dust floated up whenever the intruder took a step, but they weren't worried about kicking up dust as they were about getting ectoplasm on their boots. The doorway to the kitchen had an old carved arch that showed flowers and fairies. Now these old carvings were covered in cobwebs and art and rot. But underneath the archway from hell, the way to the kitchen was open. The kitchen inside was once the height of prestige. An iron gas burning oven now rusted shut and would sooner start a fire before cooking dinner. The sink once ceramic now broken by time and moldy from years of dripping water. The cutting table was barely standing, looked like it was going to splinter into mulch at any moment. Past that, that kitchen table was the dining room table, with the broken axe head embedded into it. Past the broken down table was a large man wearing flannel and a ghostly axe, as he was trying to chop at the wood for the stove. The ghostly axe, a blue translucent sister to the one sliced through the splinters of the table. The man's flannel was torn up and ripped in life, and in death, the rips in his clothes revealed holes in his skin. Unlike his wife in the living room, his wounds shined through his entire body. Beneath his skin, he was entirely hollow, with nothing driving his actions but the fact that they were familiar. That was what drove him in life, and in death, that was all he had left. The man was swinging his axe up and then down onto the wood pile piled up in front of him. But the axe made no noise, and the wood was never cut. A futile task, but one that the ghost didn't see as futile because he wasn't aware of why he was doing it, only that it needed to be done. Trapped, of un trapped in his task, but unaware of the fact he was trapped, the intruder could see that the father of the house had been here for a while. The wood was rotten and soggy, completely useless even as firewood. Weather, time, and ectoplasm had not been kind to the firewood. Even through their bandana, the intruder could smell the mold and rot, made even worse by the smell of death that ectoplasm carries. Still, even in this miasma, the ghost, Barnabas Riley, continued to try and chop at the firewood, focused on his last task in life that was now his only task in death. The ghost killer took their time, loading up a silver bullet with Barnabas' name on it. When it was ready, the killer took steps forward. Step. The killer stepped over a blood and rust-covered knife that once killed the Riley family. Step. The killer stood on splinters that once belonged to a chair when Barnabas tried to defend his family. Step. The killer is finally standing on the exact spot Barnabas died all those years ago. The intruder held their gun to the back of Barnabas' head and fired. Barnabas slumped forward and fell to his knees. Still, not a sound, even as he dropped his ghostly axe down on the ground. His body became next, less clear and, ec and the ectoplasm sublimated into mist as his soul traveled somewhere else. A judgment without justice. Another silvery clink as the bullet fell to the rotting wood. The intruder let out an ex exasperated sigh <sighs> as they picked up the bullet from the rotting wood pile, wincing at a small splinter of rotting wood that penetrated their gloves while looking for that one piece of silver in a pile of rot. Finally seeing something shiny, they picked it up and inspected it closely to make sure it was what they were looking for. Sure enough, the bullet was also inscribed with the name Barnabas. Pocketing the bullet, the intruder checked their final bullet in their gun. The final silver bullet was inscribed with a single name, Melvin. Satisfied, the intruder started to walk upstairs, still careful to make sure that they did not step on any holes or loose boards. Now the final part of the hunt was beginning. The intruder felt the hairs on the back of their neck stiffen, so they knew they were close to the final ghost. 
Their heart rate accelerated despite knowing how easy this hunt was going so far. Still, always finishing the hunt was the best part of the kill. Knowing that they'd almost gotten away with it, and soon they were going to be paid, and then they could walk away from the haunted house knowing they helped to make the world a place for the living. Gun at the ready, they opened the first door they saw upstairs, and it was a closet. The only thing haunting it was a mop and a tub of what looked a lot like lye. Their eyes glanced over the closet, but saw on no evidence that even ghosts or mice had visited this place in the last hundred years. They kept the door open to know where they had been, then the gunman opened the next door and saw the remnants of a large bed rotting on the floor. The smell was almost as strong as it was in the kitchen. Reaching up to the bandana to make sure it was still on, when satisfied with their face covering, they removed a vice from their pocket that looked eerily similar to a pocket watch, and then they approached the closet. The finder tool would point to ethereal energy, such as the only remaining ghost at the on the property. The watch had its hands facing towards the closet and was glowing with a blue so dark it was nearly black. Tucking the finder away, the intruder took a deep, cold breath warmed through their bandana. When exhaling, their breath was visible and when it made contact with the mirror on the closet, just a few inches in front of their face, it froze into a crystalline frost. If one could listen carefully, they could almost hear the sobs of someone inside the closet, sobs that never paused to take a breath. A very clear indication that the final frigid phantom was frozen in the closet. The intruder opened the door and aimed their gun with speed and precision, their brown eyes shining in the night and their gray gun pointing at the final ghostly figure. Hugging her knees in the closet and crying frozen tears from her brown eyes, the young woman had brown wavy hair down to her shoulders, her skin wasn't frozen like her mother's and it wasn't rotten like her father. Her dress was brown and worn like she worked for her entire life in that dress, where her knees folded in the, in the dress, the cloth was threadbare. Even a century after death, she still had dirt on her dress and calluses on her hand. Life was not unkind to her, and death only sealed her like a butterfly in amber. Her frozen tears coat parts of her dress and streamed from her eyes to the floor, creating a mirror of ice that only reflected the intruder in an empty closet. Even her own visage was veiled from her view. None of these thoughts went through the thought, through the head of the ghost killer. They aimed their gun at the heart of the heartbroken heroine, a final loud bang, and the silver bullet inscribed with the name Melvin plunged through the 30 dress and deep into the heart of the ethereal ectoplasmic entity. Unlike the others, however, this ghost kept crying. She did not dissolve, she did not evaporate, she did not sublimate. She was still where she was, only with a bullet inside her now. Judgment would not come to pass upon this poor woman. The gunman began to swear faster than a machine gun could shoot. His employer had lied to him and messed up, and now everything was going to be a lot more complicated. Police don't care after, after the mess was cleaned up, but if there were survivors, there was going to be a lot more curious and a lot more likely to find you. I was told your name was Melvin. Who messed up? How am I supposed to do my job when people can't give me the right information when I ask for it? He demanded of the ghost girl. She only continued to cry, not even aware of him, only aware of a new pain in her heart. A more literal one. However, with the intruder out of bullets and knowing that someone likely heard what happened, they instead decided to back away. There's nothing they could do. For now. They would find out this final phantom's true name and come back with a silver bullet scratched with it to dispatch of this domicile's dead denizen. I will be back for you. And I'll make sure you join the others in oblivion, they whispered to the crying ghost girl. The girl finally heard their words and only continued to cry. She was unsure what she could do to stop someone who could kill ghosts just like that. She heard the intruder run down the stairs and the door slam behind them. About an hour after they left, she heard sirens approach. In curiosity, she approached her frosted window to wave at the police officers approaching her house. The officers saw the waving ghost and were aghast. They had expected the house to be completely empty, thinking they were just investigating an exorcised haunted house. The police lieutenant in charge of the investigation was hoping it was going to be unsolvable. Simple in and out without any complicated paperwork, consulting witnesses, or questioning the victims. This is going to be a lot of paperwork, Lieutenant Tennant said to herself. Her, paper, her clipboard already overflowing as her officers brought more in for her. Sighing with her mouth and signing with her hands, she 
he tried to keep the board officers doing their job while she tried to find out what she needed to to do and where she needed to be. Now instead of just being here for a few hours, getting some overtime, leaving and calling it unsolvable, she would have to find an answer. There was a spiritual survivor and they would have to actually solve it or get Pat add publicity, which the RCPD already had enough of already. So the officer in charge, Lieutenant Louise Tennant, saw the ghost girl in the window and realized it was best to call in the only expert they had had on call for magical things to solve this case. I need you to call the expert on magical things, she told a subordinate. The subordinate made the call to their consultant, a detective who was also a master of magic, a woman who went by the name Red Prince. While the police were busy trying to uncover what was going on in the house, from the shadows someone took off their hat, folded away their bandana, and hid their pistol beneath their jacket, casually walking away from their own crime scene, confident no one would care enough about the murder of someone who had already died. After all, they got away with it before. 